Hey everybody, you're watching Legacy Television. We're Jeremy and Sarah Pearsons. We're so glad you tuned into this broadcast today. In just a few minutes, you and I are gonna get into the Word of God together. And I'm telling you the Word, the Word, if there's anything that Sarah and I have found, it's the Word that can change your life forever. You need to be hearing the Word of God, not just, not just here and there, but on a regular basis, day in and day out. And we've always said, that the time spent in the Word of God is never wasted time. So that's what we're gonna do on this broadcast today. But speaking of all that, Sarah and I wanted to take a minute and invite you to come to church. If you're not already a part of a church, come to church. Legacy Church is open to you. We are right here in beautiful Green Mountain Falls, Colorado. And I'm telling you, our good God has done good things here. He's doing great things here. And we believe greater things are yet to come. You know, the Bible, the Psalmist said, those that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of their God. And then it goes on to say that they will still be bearing fruit in old age. They will be fresh and they will be flourishing. What a promise that we have. Amen. Hey, I know that I need to be in church. You need to be in church. That's right. So come visit us. We'd love to have you. It'd be awesome to just come into this place and experience the atmosphere of faith and love. We have got a really sweet family here at Legacy Church, and we are just so thankful for what God is doing in this place. We'd love for you to be a part. We are so thankful. Sarah's exactly right. The things that we've seen over the last well, just since the church began, I mean, the Lord has done marvelous things, miraculous things. Week in and week out, people are, are sharing what we call glory stories. Those are just testimonies of the good things God has done. And all the glory goes to Him, and we're watching the Word work in people's lives. And I know many people watching this, you're probably part of a good church, planted in a good church, and that is wonderful. Uh, but if you're not, and you're hungry for a place to call home, then visit. Find out where the Lord would, would plant you. And if, and if Legacy Church is that place, then you are welcome here. But if you're looking for a place to get away, I'm telling you, there's no place more beautiful than <laughs> this place right here. And I tell people all the time, there may be churches with better views than ours. Probably I've just not. never been there. <laughs> we, we step out on this property and we look up and it's the mountains all around us. And the Lord's told us years ago, years ago, before we ever moved here, when we were looking for our our ministry home, he said, the place that you find will cause all who step on it to look up. And that is exactly what we have found in this beautiful piece of property that we're on. And besides the property, I'm talking about the inside too. It is an atmosphere of faith and love and you are welcome to come be a part of it. So right now, let's get into the Word of God together. Find out what God would say to you today that would change your life and become a doer of the Word that you hear, amen. Acts chapter four. Let's look at something we've been looking at together over the last several weeks. Acts chapter four, beginning in verse 32, the Bible says, now the multitude of those who believed were of how many hearts? One heart. What a miracle. Thousands of people with one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own but they had all things in common. Verse 33, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Notice that again, with great power, the apostles gave witness. There will never be anything more powerful to come out of your mouth than what you are a witness of. That's the most powerful thing you'll ever say to anybody is what you are a witness of. What's a witness? Somebody who has seen, somebody who has heard for themselves. You don't get called as a witness in a courtroom unless you saw something, unless you heard something. That's what makes you a witness. And if you're a witness without seeing something, you're a liar. If you're a witness and you didn't hear something, then that's not the truth. But the most powerful thing that will ever come out of your mouth is your own testimony. Amen? And that's what it's saying here. These apostles were witnesses of the resurrection. And that's why there was so much power in the preaching. They were going, we saw it, man. We heard it. We were there when he preached. We were there when they nailed him to a cross. We were there when he got up three days later. You can't tell us it didn't happen. So with great power, they gave witness. 
With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And read this next statement with me. And great grace was upon them all. Say it again. And great grace was upon them all. This is what we've been talking about for the last several weeks. The great grace of God that was on this church in the scriptures and the grace that's on this church here in Green Mountain Falls, Colorado and all of you uh, joining us online from all over the world. We're believing for great grace to be on us just the same way it was on them. And it really is kind of just a summary statement of what was going on in church. You back up a couple of chapters, Jesus had told them, go wait for the Spirit of God. And you remember this, we've talked about it. The Spirit of God filled the room where they waited. The, the Spirit of God filled them. They all began to speak with other tongues. What is that? I'm going to ask you a series of questions here, and I want you to answer me. Uh, here's a hint. The answer is, that's grace. Okay? So what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? That's grace. What about... What about the, the thousands of people that were added to the church in a single day? What is exponential church growth? What is that? That's grace. What about the miracles that began to take place where the, the lame man received strength in his feet and his ankle bones and he went running and leaping and praising God? What is that? That's grace. That's grace. What is... Um, the, the fact, you read this here just in the verses before what we just read, the Bible says there was no lack among them all. How can you have a church full of thousands of people and there not be any lack among them? What is that? That's grace. That's the grace that was on that church, and that's the grace I'm believing for you and I to begin seeing in this church. And we've already had a taste of this grace. It took grace to get this place. It took grace to get this place open. It took grace to get you here. None of this is the result of you or me or any of us working for it, performing for it, uh, deserving it. Now, there was some work involved, but as we'll see, I think, in the weeks to come, Paul tried to explain that to people. He said, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace that was with me. So where'd the strength come from to, to work on this place? What is that? What is that strength? That's grace. What is it that got you here? That's grace. Some of you came from down the street. Some of you came from other places across the nation. It's grace that got us together. It's grace that'll cause this place to grow. It's grace that'll bring people and get them born again, get them filled with the Holy Spirit. It's grace that'll be the source of the outbreak of signs, wonders, and miracles up in this church. It'll be grace. Now, like I said, we've tasted of it, but there's more. There is more grace available to it. And the thing is, if he's given more grace, I want it. Do you want it? I mean, it's like, God, if you're just giving it out, then yeah. Yeah, I'll take some. I keep thinking this phrase this week. I don't know if it's right or scriptural or not, but I'm, I'm greedy for his grace. <laughs> If he's just giving more of it away, I want it. And I want to do what we see in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 that says, continue to grow in the grace. I'm not happy. Well, I am happy, but I'm not satisfied and content to stay just with the measure of grace that we've tasted of so far. Like I said, I want to grow in it. And I want the same thing that was said about this church that we're reading about to be said about the one you and I are sitting in right now, that great grace was on all those people. Great grace on this house, great grace on your house. I got a text from a man in our church a few weeks ago, and it was probably, I'm guessing, the sixth text I've got from him just since they've been coming here and moved here to be a part of the church. One right after another, God just did this, God just did that. I just got promoted. I just got a, a better this and a raise and so on and so on. I finally just wrote him back and I was like, bro, sounds to me like great grace is on your house. Man, I'm just thinking in those terms now. And I encourage you to start doing the same thing. Great grace is on us all. I want you to look forward into the uh, fifth chapter of the book of Acts. And look at verse 12. I want to add a layer to this today. We're seeing... 
grace manifested in people being born again and people being filled with the Spirit and, and miracles happening and the church growing. All of this is this grace of God on these people. But there's another side to it. And you see it here in verse 12. 12 through 14, the Bible says, Through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. So when it says many, it's saying there's too many to, to just list. You know, a few days ago it was one. But these miracles just kept popping and popping and popping. And now he's got to sum it up by saying it, it was a lot of them. Too many to name. Many signs and wonders done among the, among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Verse 13, yet none of the rest dared join them. Listen to this phrase. But the people esteemed them highly. Now verse 14 says, believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So it's really just kind of a recounting of what we've already seen so far. Miracles are happening. The church is growing like crazy. Now this verse says there's the, 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 none of the rest of them dared join them. It's kind of strangely worded because you get to the next verse and you see where a lot of people are joining them. One translation says no one dared harm them. It's interesting. No one dared harm them. And yet I imagine there were those that wouldn't join them out of fear of the religious people and fear of men's opinions and what they might do to them. So however you read it, there were some that wouldn't join. There were those that wouldn't dare harm them because, notice that statement again, the people esteemed them highly. So you've got favor with God, right? The grace of God on them and everything we've already talked about. But now you add this other layer to it. And they've got favor with people, favor with God, favor with men. As the grace of God grows on you and on your life, one of the ways that grace manifests and shows up over and over again is the favor that you have with other people. You need some favor with other people. And God knew that we would need some favor with other people. We are living in a world, and in case you hadn't noticed, you're not the only one in it. I know a lot of people live like they're the only one in it, but you ain't. And I hope that's not news to anybody in here this morning. But we're not the only ones in it. You interact with people all the time. And like you've heard me say before, there are many people I believe that are like, man, I'd be an awesome Christian if it weren't for other people. If there was nobody else in this world, man, I'd be loving God. I'd be the most exemplary Christian you could find. But you're not the only one. There are other people, and you and I need favor with other people. Amen. Now, when you see that favor show up in your life, you need to be quick to recognize and say, what is that? That's grace. That's grace. And it's not just grace and favor with them, but it's an overflow and a manifestation of the grace and the favor that you have with God. But you need some favor with other people. And you want it too, right? I mean, think about how different your life would be if you had just overflowing favor with other people, other men and women. What if there were just on a regular basis people just doing stuff for you and they had no idea why they were doing it for you? What if, what if you were in a store and, and you needed to buy something or needed to make an exchange and the person behind the register said, you know what, I don't even know why I'm doing this, but here's two more boxes of peaches. <laughs> Didn't we hear something about that already this morning? <laughs> Be quick to recognize favor, yeah. favor with people. I know when, we're, uh, when we were building this place and doing a lot of construction here and the construction we're getting ready to do, man, I need some favor. I want favor with the Colorado Department of Transportation. I want favor with city officials. I, I want people to go, you know what? We never do this for anybody, but come on. Would you like that happening in your life? Favor with other people. What does that look like? It's not just people doing something for you, but it's people being open to you. It's, be, it's people being receptive to you. 
where they wouldn't be before, but you've got favor with them, so you've got the ability to say something. You've got the ability to be a witness or, or communicate in a way to them that maybe they are closed off to everybody else, but there's something about you. Maybe they are the crankiest person in the office, and they don't get along with nobody but you. And there's just something about you. And they just walk by your desk and they think, I don't know why, but I like that guy. I like that girl. What is that? That's favor. That's grace. We've been looking at that verse in the book of Luke chapter 2, talking to us about Jesus and his childhood. From the time he was 12 to the time he was 30, the Bible says he grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor. Now listen, favor with who? Favor with God. And it's that same word translated grace. Grace, favor, favor, grace. And yes, Jesus spent those 18 years growing in that grace of God, growing in that anointing, growing in that assignment. But all the while that was happening, what else was going on? He was growing in favor, not just with God, but with men. Growing in favor with God and men. And you can see it in his life, right? I mean, you have to have a crazy amount of favor to walk up to a couple of dudes in a fishing boat who you don't know and they don't know you, and you say to them, hey, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. What's that mean? Now, you and I have the luxury of 2,000 years of knowing what he meant by that. These guys are like, what'd he say? And yet they looked at him, and there was something about him there was something, I like to say, magnetic, that they dropped their net and followed him. That's favor. It's favor with men that Jesus could stand up and preach. And the Bible says the common people heard him gladly. There was an openness to receive from him. Why? Because Jesus just spent the last 18 years growing in grace and growing in favor with God, sure, but with people. This may come as a shock to you, but people liked Jesus. Now, I say that with like a little asterisk next to it because not everybody did. There were, sure, there were thousands that came to hear him preach. Thousands that came to witness the miracles and receive of the grace of God, sure. But then there were those, and it just seemed like it was their mission in life to oppose him. Take him out. Look for fault. I mean, how would you like that? If somebody followed you around everywhere you went, listening to you, waiting for you to make a mistake. Jesus had trouble with two groups of people more than anybody else. Pharisees and family. So don't be shocked when you have trouble with the same two groups. Pharisees and family. So here's Jesus who's been growing in favor with God and men, favor with God and men, favor with God and men. But what I, need to, what I need you to understand is that having favor with people doesn't mean everybody likes you. It's not about having favor with everyone. It's about ha having favor with the right ones. Right? I mean, there are some people in some places right now, places in government, places in business, places in the community, and they can help you. They can help you get what you need. They can help you do what you need to do. We've already addressed our business owners today. What would it be like to run your business with great favor with the city, great favor with the county, great favor with people in places now, you don't have to have everybody like you. You don't have to have everybody showing you favor, but there are some right ones in some right places with the favor of God and the favor of men on your life. You can get some doors open. You can get some things done. Amen? So that's what I want to talk about this morning. That overflow of the grace, the grace and favor that we have with God spilling over into favor with other people. What if... What if I were able to take you in Scripture to a key? Everybody say a key. A key. A key that unlocks that kind of favor. 
I mean, if I handed you that key today, would you put it into practice? Would you go right away to unlock whatever grace and favor has been locked up and you've needed access to? Would you go to work today in getting more of that favor, both with God and with people, men and women? Sure you would. Don't turn there. I'm going to read this to you out of the book of Proverbs, but I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, let's just look at verse 3. Put that on the screen for us. Proverbs 3, verse 3 in the New Living Translation. Notice what it says here. Everybody look at it. Never. Well, there's a strong word. Never let loyalty, other translations say faithfulness. That's what loyalty is, right? It's faithfulness. A man who is loyal to his wife is a faithful man. A woman who is loyal to her husband, to her family, that's a faithful woman. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. How often should loyalty and kindness leave you? Never. Ever. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. I like it. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Tie what around your neck? Loyalty and kindness. I want to center in on kindness. This word kindness you're going to see today as we talk about it, is much more than niceness. Now, niceness is a good place to start. If you haven't been nice, go ahead and start. It's a good place. But you study this word, particularly this one, and it's, it's more than niceness. It's what Sarah already ministered to us about this morning. It's the, the hesed. That's the Hebrew word for it. The hesed, kindness of God. It's covenant kindness. It has to do with mercy. And actually some translations say that. Never let faithfulness and mercy leave you. It's that loving kindness of God. It's the tender mercies of God. You start talking about kindness and you start tapping on the heart of God. It's what makes him who he is. Well, I thought God was love. Yeah. Now you go, we don't take time to turn there, but if you were to look at 1 Corinthians 13, that great love chapter, right? There's a long list in in 1 Corinthians 13 of comprised of what love is, what love does. There's a lot of things in that list about what love is not. What love does not do, love is not rude, love does not behave unbecomingly, love does not keep a record of wrongs, love does not envy, love does not boast, right? Over and over and over again. So that should tell you, you can learn as much about love by studying what it's not as you can by studying what it is and what it does do. But by contrast, it's interesting to me that out of that whole list, there are two words that define what love is. The greatest force in all the universe. The force that created this place. The force that sustains this place. The force that gives you life every single day. I mean, you take a deep breath. Where'd you get that? Love gave that to you. And two words describe the whole thing. You go through that list of all the things it's not. Of all the things it doesn't do. There are only two words to tell you what it is. Love is patient and love is kind. You have just summed up God. I mean, if it's even possible to say that all that he is and all that he does can be surmised in these two words, in his patience and in his kindness. And you start talking about kindness, you're talking about him. Keep your place here. But Ephesians chapter 2 says in verse 4, he said, God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. He made us alive together with Christ by grace, by that gift you've been saved and raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now listen, that in the ages to come, 
That's not just today. That's not just next week. That's not just the rest of your life on this planet. That's in eternity. This is what's going to be happening for eternity. That in the ages to come, he might show. Somebody say show. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace. How's he going to do it? In his kindness. He is going to spend eternity showing you something. You and I are going to spend the eons in the presence of God. And do not be surprised one day, 10,000 years, 100,000 years from now, when God comes to your mansion and says, you busy? And you say, not too busy for you. And he says, I want to show you something. I want to show you something. What is it to be shown? You can see it. It's more than talk. It's more than words. I want to show you something. And yeah, his grace is wonderful. It's a wonderful thing to talk about. It's a wonderful thing to believe. But you want to know how he proves it? You want to know how he shows his grace? In his kindness. I'm going to show you something. Kindness. That's the word he used when he said, never let kindness leave you. Tie it around your neck. Let's say you're getting ready in the morning. Gentlemen, you've probably done this at least once in your life. You're getting ready. You're going somewhere nice. You put on the suit, the jacket. You got the button-up shirt. But you're not done yet, are you, right? Depending on how nice the place is, you got to go. There are some places you can go in this world and some high-level business things where if you don't have a tie on, you're not finished getting ready. I've been in a few places like that where it was just right to wrap that thing around your neck, cinch it up tight. I don't know the dude that came up with that or what his problem was, but it's a part <laughs> of culture all over the world today. You're not done getting ready sometimes until you wrap that thing around your neck and you, the rabbit goes around the tree and down the hole and you pull it up tight. But if you notice this, fellas, you ever worn a tie before? Can I see your hands? Just some participation today. Thank you. You notice something about that tie? Once you put it on, it went everywhere you went all day long. Why? Because it was wrapped around your neck. And I don't know if you've thought about this before, but everywhere your neck goes, you go. If your neck ever goes somewhere that you didn't go, it's just the one time. It will, it will never happen again. Can you see what he's saying? And we need to treat it the same way. Some people will drive away from the house on their half hour drive to work, get 28 minutes there, realize they forgot their phone and think, I'm naked without that. I got to go home, right? Go home, get the phone, get the wallet, whatever it was you forgot. We got to think the same way about kindness. If that's not wrapped around your neck, when you're leaving the home, you didn't get finished getting dressed.